All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Understanding CBD. I am your host, Stephen Wallman from Wallman's Apothecary. For those that don't know, we do very high-end CBD tinctures made from hemp. Um, our labeling is very unique because we do full panel testing, cannabinoids, terpenes, um, outdoor soil grown in a regenerative food farm in Maryland. Um, enough about me. Um, I want to definitely get to our guest today because we have a lot to cover. Uh, the title, which is uh, The Secrets of Our Legal Cannabis Industry. And um, what we have here today is Nick Alexander. So Nick, can, Nick is going to bring a tremendous perspective and put cannabis in context all the way back from the early days when cannabis was uh, just starting to be legalized in California. Um, Nick, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So, you know, Nick and I connected on our passion, which is um, obviously cannabis is medicine and helping people realize that this is something that you can cultivate on your own. Um, we did a, a, a live stream yesterday with Jim Barry, who kind of gave us through a details of how to get started and some of the things that you would need. But we really didn't get into the why. Like, why would you want to go and create an environment in your own in your own home and cultivate your own cannabis. So that's what we're going to uncover a little bit today with Nick. And when we finish this, um, there'll be probably some more questions as well, but um, at least you'll get a chance to meet Nick and as a, as a fantastic resource to get a lot of these questions answered. Um, Nick, to get us started off with uh, your background is just, and with cannabis is really unique. Can you give us, you know, just like a quick glimpse into how you got into cannabis and your experience as a grower? Yeah, absolutely. So started growing a while ago now. It's been about 12 years and started actually growing, uh, admittedly, in the legacy market in Indianapolis. And like I said, done that for 12 years in 2016, actually moved to Colorado. And that was my first experience with the commercial cannabis industry as it pertains to the, um, the recreationally legal market. And what I experienced there was quite troubling. So it was an 18 hour road trip from Indianapolis to Denver. And I smoked some cannabis from the green solution, almost immediately had a panic attack, which is not something I've ever had. I knew something was amiss. I've been smoking my own homegrown organic cannabis for 12 years. I never had put any toxins in my body that I believe I was experiencing uh, with the cannabis from the green solution. Backing up a little bit, I did live in California in 2006, 2007, under Prop 215, the first medical legislation in the country. And I got to tell you, the cannabis at that time was exceptional. And the reason I believe it was so exceptional is because being the only place in the entire country, you could legally buy cannabis tax and regulated, sort of. It wasn't as regulated as things are now with metric and some of the seed to sale systems as, as it is today. But there wasn't a, a lot of competition. So I believe that people were able to maintain small batch, quality grows, really beautiful plants, some of the, the really storied strains that you'll remember from back in the day, OG Kush, Granddaddy Purple, some real California classics. And it was just an amazing experience. Trichomes, just, you know, out the wazoo, the, the, the flavonoid profile, the turf profiles are just amazing. And what you see now in the commercial space is really, really disappointing. So I actually worked at seven different commercial grows when I lived in the Denver area. And I was doing that through a company called Hemp Temps. So they send you to different grows and you'll grow at a place for a few weeks. And I did this specifically to educate myself on what was going on. You know, if something was amiss, something was wrong with this cannabis. And what I found was everything from seed to cure was a process where they were rushing everything, cutting every corner possible to get products heavier and quicker to shelf. And that's the total antithesis of what this plant should be done when I grow at home in small batch grows. Everything is done to get the best possible medicine uh, humanly possible. I take my time. I make sure to do the right sourcing for my genetics. I make sure not to use noxious chemicals and never use pesticides. I do a slow cure, slow dry, and really try to let the cannabis be um, at its absolute pinnacle when it is time to harvest as opposed to what I saw in these commercial grows was noxious chemicals and just really a lack of care for anything concerning quality. So that's kind of in a nutshell been my experience with commercial grows. It really is a race to the bottom. The more states legalize, I've, and I've consumed in 18 recreationally legal states because I used to travel for work and I would go to these different states. 
every state is worse than the next. I mean, it's just really disappointing what it's become in this country. And so to answer your question, you know, people should grow at home because A, it's not that hard if you have someone kind of guiding you, which is what my business is, Cannabis Home Grow Consulting. And if you don't have someone helping you and consulting with you, it's quite a challenge because it's the ultimate trial and error. There, you know, it's a plant. There's so much subjectivity to it. What you really want to do is have someone working with you hand in hand. They can kind of show you the ropes and, and teach you how to grow clean cannabis and do it in a small batch way. Now, I've got a quick, I mean, a bunch of questions. We'll kind of walk them through. Um, so when you were growing in California in the early days when it was, there was no pressure, right? It was the, the plant was being freed up and you could grow under the environment that you wanted to small batch. Um, were you still doing lab tests then? Were you testing for cannabinoid ratios and terpene profiles? So I want to be clear. I never grew in California. So that was 2006, oh, okay. 2007. Like I said, I've been growing for about 12 years. So, but what I will tell you, is a buddy of mine actually ended up having a roommate at his house who was a grower for one of the dispensaries. So I was getting ready to get a medical card, which at the time were $80 in LA County, um, opted to, you know, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? So I just got cannabis directly from this grower, but I can't speak to what the testing was in California back then. What I will say just concerning what I saw it was very much operating in a very gray area because even though it was legal at the state level, I believe it was similar to what we're finding now where the municipalities have to vote in, into and it, meaning commerce, into law where you actually have a tax and regulated system. But I know a lot of the places were unlicensed. So I don't know if the testing was necessarily more stringent back then. I just believe that because people weren't producing it at mass scale, that things weren't slipping through the cracks the way that they are now where you have 500,000 square feet, you know, greenhouses. And it's just very unrealistic to think that you can cover every cubic meter of that area and be able to detect things early like mold, like pests. And by the time people are able to actually get to these problems, you know, it's too late. And then they have to do a lot of really toxic processes in order to get it to pass testing if they're not circumventing testing altogether. Yeah, that's that's some of the things I wanted to dig into. And really like the, you know, as a I, I mean, I'm in the industry, I understand a lot of the manufacturing. I look at all the tests, the lab tests. Um, is there some things? I mean, you obviously can't test for everything. You're only testing for what you're going after. You know, what are the cannabinoids here? And you have to know what they are and you have to know what terpenes potentially may show up in order to test. And if you're going to heavy metal test, you have to say we're going to test for these five or six or whatever you know, most companies are going to go with the minimal requirement it's going to be. We obviously test for everything. Um, what is it that would be present in the cannabis when you're cutting corners that may not be there for small batch? So definitely noxious pesticides that, frankly, with FDA or USDA oversight would be banned, which is not a factor because, as we all know, cannabis is federally illegal and those are federal entities. Mold, for sure. And then th those are probably the biggest two. Heavy metals is obviously another one. Typically, if you're finding heavy metals in your plants, man, you're, you're doing something wrong um, because it's typically not something you're going to get from, from nutrients. In my experience, you're going to get that through phytoremediation. For those of you listening that aren't familiar with that, that's where the plants clean the soil. So I had a co-worker at a place where I worked in Colorado who was growing huge plants just in the ground. Now, this is Colorado, not great soil. It's not like the Midwest where we have all these lush forests that, you know, you go in and the moisture content is so high that you have, uh, you know, the, the correct molds and the correct microbiological organisms that create this really great soil. It's basically soil that is, it's a semi-desert grassland. So it's all plains and it's just basically year after year, a very high sediment content soil and so anyway, when he told me he was growing in his backyard, I was like, you're not using pots or anything like that. And he's like, no, I was like, OK, do you know what phytoremediation is? And he's like, no, what's that? And I'm like, OK, uh, you really need to know what that is, because I promise you, your cannabis is containing heavy metals because we're right outside the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, through the, the natural processes that occur, um, you know, the tectonic activities that create mountains, things like that, you're going to get those heavy metals. So he gave me some of his cannabis and I smoked it. And I, and I swear, Stephen, this was some of the most harsh smoke I've ever experienced in my life. He blamed it on the ash that was falling on the, 
cannabis from forest fires that we had the year previously, because we do have really bad forest fires. We're getting a you know, terrible smoke today in the Chicagoland area. I couldn't believe how bad it is here. But he blamed it on that. And while there may have been some truth to that, I, I truly believe that it was the heavy metals that I was actually uh, smoking because I've never had anything that harsh of smoke. So, yeah, definitely the, the toxic chemicals, the mold. Now, don't they have to and, test for that? Don't the dispensaries have to test the... So cannabis? that's, yeah, so that's a funny thing. There's a, a bunch of ways to work around that. So I have a buddy who worked for a company, both of which will remain nameless due to libel, but he worked for the largest concentrate company in the United States. You can Google that to find out what that is. <laughs> so he was actually the compliance officer for the lab testing. So this guy knows better than anybody. So um, this is, these are some of the ways they would circumvent these tests. One is that the people would, and I experienced as it grows as well, only select the absolute best specimens that they would then send to the lab, knowing that it represented probably less than 0.001% of that actual batch harvest due metric. And those are the samples that they would submit to um, this company. I'm trying not to say the name. Got and it. So you could, you could grow one plant even or in, in a different type of environment, get a different result and, and send that away for testing. You could. Metric is supposed to make sure that everything is contained in the same room, but that is through, through cameras and security and things like that and through the, the scan bars, the UPCs. But, uh, you know, that's a that's a beatable system. You know, unless someone's watching every second of every day, that's a beatable system. So that's one way that they do it is only sending in the cleanest material. Mm -hmm. Another way is, let's say, it fails testing and they send in a couple pounds or something like that. They send it back and then what they will do is they will turn that into isolate. So isolate is, for those of you that don't know, it's generally the concentrate that's put into vape pens. It's, it's, uh, the viscosity is pretty thin. It's pretty runny. And so with that, my understanding is it's very hard to detect some of these things that will fail testing after you put it into isolate and then the isolate is tested. So that's another way that they can circumvent it. Hmm. And then a third way would be, obviously, you know, people that work there, you're greasing palms, you're doing all this shady stuff that, frankly, a lot of people in the legacy market, it's part of the culture. And then they transfer that over to the legal industry. So that's another way that they do it. And then just to, to piggyback on top of that. So we had flour at a company in Boulder that would fail testing. And what we would do is, or we, excuse me, we knew it would fail testing because of mold, specifically mold spores. So we would do a peroxide bath. So what this consists of is basically putting peroxide into a bath of water. It's you know a big tub. And then we would dip the stalks with the flour into it, and then we would dry it. Well, there's a myriad of issues with that. One being you're dipping it into water, which could cause more mold. Another thing would be that we then have to rush it to get dry with fans, which causes a very you know, a, a flash drying, which destroys turps, destroys flavonoids, destroys everything as far as the entourage effect of it being real medicine. And then there's the obvious, we're putting a combustible flower in peroxide, which is poison. You can, you can dye my hair white with peroxide and I obviously have jet black hair. So what they claim during that process when we're dipping, as we call it, is that, oh, it's such a low concentration, doesn't really matter. Mm, yeah. I, uh, I may have been born at night, but not last night. It's still peroxide. You're still combusting. It's just an example of that. Um, tobacco, for instance, raw tobacco contains several hundred carcinogens. When you combust it, it turns into tens of thousands of carcinogens. So I don't even want to know what peroxide is going to turn into when you combust it. So those are some of the ways that they circumvent. It's really shady and it's, it's very scary. And the average consumer has no idea these practices are being implemented. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a, a shame and I don't want to create a bunch of fear about going to a dispensary and buying um, cannabis um, because it's available and some people don't have any legal way of accessing it. Are there certain things that um, you can look for in a brand or certain questions that consumers can ask outside of the lab report? Because, you know, we know lab reports are you know only as good as the people that are representing them. So the short answer is no. The only way to really know for sure, it's really the Pepsi challenge. You got to go to a dispensary and you got to try it out yourself. Now, here's the tough thing about that. I always use the fast food example. If you eat McDonald's seven days a week for a year, you can probably eat it and sustain and not get sick. But if you stick to, and this is a real example that, that 
happened to me. I do a plant-based diet and I try not to do, you know, fast food, preservatives, all those, those noxious things that, that are really bad for you. And I ate a plant-based diet for, you know, 18 months. And then I got some McDonald's and I never felt sicker. Now I used to eat McDonald's like in college all the time and I felt fine. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly putting these toxins in your body, yes, it's doing long-term debilitating things to your body, but you may not notice them because your body through sensory adaptation is allowed for these things to into your body. And it doesn't, your body doesn't think that they're bad. So that's why I gave the example of when I went to the green solution, I knew right away that something was wrong. So it's very hard to determine that if you've been consuming cannabis for only the past, you know, maybe five, 10 years, because the, the race at the bottom has been going on for such a long time. There are certain dispensaries that do grow clean cannabis. So I'll give an example, uh, legal L apostrophe Eagle, Le Eagle in Denver is the only clean green certified and what specifically the parameters are around clean green certified. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it's the only clean green certified grow in Colorado. And let me tell you, when you consume their cannabis, it is exceptional. It is the only cannabis I've ever smoked in my life that I would say is comparable to small batch homegrown. And you know, right away. And for people, again, who only smoke your run of the mill, Walmart weed, mass produced dispensary, commercial grow weed, cannabis, I should say, um, you know, you're, you're used to that crappy taste. You're used to the burn of, uh, in the lungs and in the throat. It doesn't mean anything different to you. So when you switch and you go to a place that really is exceptional, you, you, you taste all the turps, you do a slow exhale through the nose, so you can really enjoy that terpene profile. And it's something that is on a connoisseur level. Now, it is more expensive, but frankly, Colorado cannabis is very inexpensive compared to Illinois cannabis. In Illinois, you're looking at about $400 an ounce on average. In Colorado, you can get a pretty good ounce. Well, pretty good for their standards, comparable to a $400 ounce for about $125. So you really got to do your homework and look for things like Clean Green Certified. But out of the over 100 dispensaries I probably went to in Colorado, legal is the only one I would vouch for. I used to vouch for Verde Natural but I hadn't smoked them in a long time. So I don't know what changes they may have implemented in that time period. So I can't vouch for them anymore. Um, Ascend in Colorado, which is not the same Ascend that's here, um, used to be really good. They used to be permaculture, no-till organic. I think they've changed that, but legal is still doing uh, permaculture. Where do you see the pressures coming from for these um, cannabis companies in order to perform this way? Like what, what's the pressure? Is it investors? Is it regulations? So it's, it's, yeah. So it's, it's business 101. These got to stay in business and the margins are razor thin. So that is due to overregulation in certain areas. So in California, for instance, you need a million dollars of cash just to have it, you know, a snowball's chance in hell of getting a license and then having the upstart capital in order to do vertical integration, be able to build out a storefront. It's very cost prohibitive for most people. It's very, very challenging. So I was just reading an article today in MJ Biz this morning, and they said that less than 25% of cannabis operations recreationally in this country are profitable. I think that number is really high. I wouldn't put that number higher than 15%, what I've seen in doing my own research. That was a pretty small sample size that I don't think is a good reflection of the population of what's really going on in this country. And then you're seeing a lot of diversion into the black market um, for the people that are staying on top of what's happening with the glass house right now. They're in a dispute right now with the defamation of character suit by another MSO who is claiming that they're diverting a lot of their cannabis into the black market because people are overproducing. So the two examples of that I would give is in Colorado, there's a dispenser on every corner. So the margins are so razor thin. You have to hire the most inexperienced people. You have to use plant artificial plant growth regulators that are developed for landscapers and not developed to be anything you put in your body and consume using noxious uh, pesticides, fungicides, all these things that you have to do when you're growing in these huge greenhouses. So it just comes down to dollar and cents. Uh, people, and I blame the government, and because we've, we've really screwed up legalization in this country. I mean, it, it's appalling. Um, you know, I was so excited when Colorado and Washington in 2012 first got the legislation going. It's like, oh, cool. It's going to be like California again. It's nothing like California was under Prop 215. And the legislation that passed in 1996, again, the first medical legislation in this country to pass. It's absolutely nothing like that. And so, yeah, too many 
too many growers in places like Oregon, where they have a natural outdoor climate, we can grow cannabis most of the year, uh, too many retail shops in areas where it's densely populated, and, and frankly, you know, too much greed in places where it's $400 an ounce in, in places like Chicago, you know, they're going to hold on to that as long as they can. Because when we see federal legalization in probably five, six years, it's not going to be $400 an ounce anymore. It's, it's going to go down to 100 the way it is in some of these other MSO uh, territories. Yeah, that's what I wanted to also get a feel for. Um, well, well, let me. I'm going to get to your future projection, but as we get down the road a little bit in the conversation, but the, um, you know, these these multi-state operators that are there that you know they're operating razor thin. The product that they put out from there, do you see it um, providing medicinal value to someone? I mean, we're in a context, you know, versus a pharmaceutical drug. We're still talking about cannabis, which in my opinion, would be better. But do you see this as, as um, doing more harm than good? And, um, you know, where should, should you think you're safer with some of the smaller, smaller companies that aren't as scaled up to, you know, be mass producing? Yeah, great, great question. There's just there's so much to unpack there. The first thing I would say is, yes, I do believe there still is a medicinal benefit, even if they are using pesticides, even if they are using fungicides, because cannabis is, for, for those that don't know, it's, it's the most efficacious medicine known to man. It's, it's the, the longest running. It's been used for a documented, even documented probably before that, but 5,000 years. You know, you talk about hundreds of thousands of deaths a year from legal things like pharmaceuticals, alcohol, tobacco. Hundreds of thousands of Americans die every year from these things. No one's ever died of cannabis ever in 5,000 years. And anybody that looks at those statistics and still, you know, kowtows to willful ignorance, like a lot of my conservative family, it's just infuriating because you're, you're willfully putting poison in your body and you're ignoring these things. Having said that, it's kind of like, so I, I like multi-grain bread, right? But I know Monsanto has a monopoly on wheat in this country, and I know they use Roundup. And they can't get Roundup off of wheat. So even though I'm consuming the best possible multigrain bread that I can consume, that is still, you know, it's still has gluten and those sorts of things. Um, there is definitely a negative consequence to consuming the pesticides like Roundup to consuming what I've been heard referred to as Franken wheat, which is where Monsanto has genetically engineered a wheat that will produce the top grain um, in half the time that it normally takes, kind of like chickens with steroids six weeks as opposed to six months to reach maturity. So anytime we introduce these artificial processes, it always has a negative effect on human beings. So with food, it's the, the gut microbiome. Um, with, with cannabis, since everyone has an endocannabinoid system, more receptors from the endocannabinoid system than any other system in our bodies. We are literally hardwired to consume cannabis, to use it efficaciously as medicine. And when we have these CB1 and CB2 receptors, and then we're in, introducing pesticides and zero tall and mold into these same receptors that are taking in phytocannabinoids and taking in CBD and, and THC and all these things, you can't help but believe that there will be long-term debilitating effects. What they are, I don't know. Sadly, mm -hmm. as is oftentimes in this country, we wait till we got a bunch of really sick people um, until we retroactively try to address things. That's healthcare in this country in, in a nutshell. I mean, it's why mm -hmm. cannabis is illegal. It's, you know, you, you have big pharma, you even have big alcohol lobbying against cannabis. Partnership for a drug-free America. For instance, some of their major sponsors are alcohol companies, which is a drug. They have statisticians on staff telling you, telling them that people who consume cannabis are less likely to consume alcohol and they don't want their they don't want their profits and their revenues to go down. So they will spread lies like what you see, these ridiculous ads where a girl is turned into a pancake on a couch and doesn't want to pet her dog. Please, <laughs> every, every every stoner knows you are in love with your dog when you're stoned off your ass. I mean, let's just be real. Yeah, so we can set the record straight on some of these misconceptions, because that's one of the things I wanted to talk about, which were, you know, what do you think of some of these misconceptions in the from the general public? And, and one of them is that if you're in the cannabis business and you're making money hand over fist, um, is that true? Is what, is what true? Making money and like everyone who's in the cannabis business, you're you're just rolling in the dough. Uh, well, no, uh, as I said, you know, over 75 percent of people are actually losing money that are actually in the retail cannabis space um, as well as the commercial growth space. So 
most people are not making money. Um, I definitely believe that uh, to answer your other question. Yes, I do believe going with smaller companies is better for your health generally, but you have to look at places that aren't vertically integrated, like Oregon, for instance. Um, basically, the reason it's such a wash there is because they have way more produced than they can possibly get into dispensaries. But one toxic grow may produce to the big guys and to the small guys. So without that vertical integration, you need to be looking at that and understanding, OK, hey, maybe it's a small storefront, but they're getting the same Walmart weed as the green solution is or... You know, I, I don't want to name other companies, but Lightshade and, and some yeah. of those. So, um, yeah, people aren't making money in general. Um, the people that are making money are the people that are charging top dollar for top cannabis. So I believe legal, the, the dispensary that I mentioned earlier, I do believe they are probably profitable because they will charge $50 for an eighth before taxes where you can get an eighth in Colorado for a popcorn bud for 20 bucks out the yeah. door. So, they so are, are, you seeing the, are you seeing the craft grows that are people that are actually doing it the right, that are making that extra investment, are able to um, pass that knowledge on to the consumers so consumers will purchase it? So that's what's tough. You know, if if you want that knowledge to be there, you have to hire the people that are going to be able to give it to you. Now, let's just be honest. For, for most people that go to a dispensary, the bud tenders, which is a horrible terminology, you know, we shouldn't be comparing them to, to bartenders, but... The bud tenders, for instance, are generally very ignorant towards the processes that are actually implemented in grows or the products themselves. That's been my experience in Colorado. Now, I'll tell you right now, I've never even been to a dispensary in Illinois because I don't I don't smoke Walmart weed. I, I would like to do it just to have the personal experience of seeing what goes on. But I would assume being largely in Illinois, it's, it's multi-state operators that came from other states that they basically can't pay people with the razor within margins that they have probably more in Chicago land. Cause like I said, it's 400 an ounce, but still, you know, they're not paying people. They're not buying talent and therefore it's hard to get that communication across. So most bud tenders in my experience, they have no idea how it's grown. And I've tested yeah. people in Colorado. I'm like, so how is this grown? Is this hydroponic? Is it organic? Do you know if it's no-till? They don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't even know the vernacular, let alone be able to tell me what that specific product has or doesn't well, have. I guess it's on the same vein here. How do you see the role that sales and marketing plays in the dispensary business? Because it's medicine, but now you have to implement your sales and marketing strategies. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's paramount important, I believe. And, you know, I'm a marketing major and it was a marketing major in college. And, you know, I've worked at ad agencies. I've worked in sales my whole life. So it's, it's so, so important. So what legal do has done in Colorado which is the best example I can think of, is they're essentially the, the Apple store of dispensaries. Now, I don't mean that in the sense that you come in and there's this you know, clean aesthetic to it, because it's, it's not actually, it's, it's not super great aesthetically, but what they have done through a great product, the same way Apple has, is once you actually use the product, you realize the superiority that that product has compared to other dispensaries, and then they can build onto that brand. And so, you know, any great marketer will tell you that, you know, a brand is not your logo, a, a brand is not your color scheme or your website, your brand is your product. And then everything has to follow up on the back end to reflect that quality in your com marketing communications, you know, in your logo, in your branding, those things are important, but only if you have a great product, you know, you can have the, the best logo and the best marketing and the best salespeople in the world. But at the end of the day, if your product is crap, you know, that brand is still crap. So it's important to have those devices in place and those touch points in place, but you have to start with a great product. And that's really what I believe that, that legal has done. And so it's, it's, it's really paramount. I believe. You think that through educating consumers, um, they, to demand quality, this is actually a question here. We got from a, from a, a listener here, Linda, she's with Walmart's apothecary too. Um, but are, you know, consumers asking about the safety and products available. And if they do demand for clean, safe products to increase, will suppliers adjust? I know. You know, I hate to say this, but I, I don't think that people will. And, and here's the unfortunate reality of it. Most consumers, now your baby boomers might be a little bit different, but most consumers today, great cannabis, you know, I talk about 2006, 2007 in, in California. It's a distant memory. People have accepted that cannabis is this mass-produced, PGR-laced, pesticide-laced, 
you know, manila crap that it all looks the same. It all tastes the same. And people have kind of unfortunately accepted that this is the status quo and this is what the industry is. My goal, my life's mission in running my business is to educate people. You know, I just wrote a blog today trying to teach people about how, look, it doesn't have to be like this. What really breaks my heart is knowing that there are people out there with debilitating diseases that will consume cannabis maybe for the first time from one of these MSOs. And they're like, oh, it's terrible. Like it was a horrible experience. The same way I had a horrible experience the first time I smoked MSO cannabis myself. Yeah, but and wait, they, they must have gotten the indica. They should have gotten the sativa. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things. You know, it's, it's that misinformation there because people want to, you know, put strains into different boxes. But, yeah. you know, all so I'm a sativa guy, you know, if you will, um, or enough lifting high, you know, sativa and indica is obviously a taxonomy. It's, it's not necessarily the way it makes you feel. And that's another misconception. But I'm a sativa guy, quote unquote. I'm a racier high. I'm a more cerebral high guy. But I will smoke indica for the rest of my life if it's clean, as opposed to smoking my favorite strain of sativa if it's dirty. I believe that the contamination of cannabis it is horrible. But again, going back to the fast food example, if that's all you've ever smoked, you probably don't have the adverse effect that I have because yeah. I don't eat fast food and I don't smoke dispensary weed. Right. So, well, let's make a let's make a little transition here because um, I want to spend some time to talk about um, really your um, your passion and what you can help people with, which is helping them grow their own. Um, I always think that it is our it should be our right for everyone to be able to grow uh, their own cannabis and its medicine, and it used to be our duty as Americans to grow it. Um, you know, getting started, we talked about the environment. Um, what what is a, a good tip that you have for? And I think you know we've sort of raised a lot of the questions of, as to why you would want to grow it. Um, what, what do you see as the big hurdles that people need to overcome in order to get started with and to get going? Yeah, I would say the biggest hurdle is thinking it's a huge hurdle. Okay, it's not. It's growing plants. Now anybody can grow really good cannabis. The problem that I had the first time I grew in, I guess, would have been 2011, 2012, was yield. It's hard to, when you're starting to consistently get great yield and great quality. The very first plant that I had, now it was an auto flower that harvested early, wasn't supposed to be. And you'll find this sometimes in seed packs. Some plants turn into auto flowers. I got five grams out of that plant. Five. I mean, that's, that's not, an ex, that's not a, a small exaggeration. I got five grams out of a plant. Uh, my last harvest stifle, I pulled 4.2 pounds out of a 650 watt light. So the hardest thing is definitely getting yield in the beginning. And then I would say the best thing that you can do is, so the blog that I wrote this morning was why books and, and tutorial, video tutorials on YouTube and things aren't really that effective. And this is really the, the ethos behind my entire business is every individual is a unique individual, has specific needs, a specific consumption habits, a specific amount of cannabis that they will need for medicine. And you really need to work with someone that will help you to customize that. So what I do in my own business is I will do a free 15 minute consultation. And I ask them the things that I just mentioned, you know, how do you smoke? How often do you smoke? What strains do you like? Is discretion a concern for you, et cetera, and so forth. And then I build out a custom grow for them and then when they decide that they do want to work with me during that first hour, I will give them every single piece of materials, equipment, nutrients, where to source the genetics, everything they need to get started. And that is specific to the person. So when you go on Amazon and you see these all in one kits, well, you know, one size fits all is great for a baseball cap. But for consumers of cannabis, nothing could be further from the truth. I spent so much money on things I didn't need when I first started. Because this now, granted, this is Indiana in 2011. The only guys that I could talk with were the guys at my local grocery store. Well, you go to a barber, he's going to tell you you need a haircut every time. So they were just piling products onto me. You know, they got a business to run. I get it fine. But I could have saved 90% of my money and got 10 times the yield if I was working with someone that's experienced. So definitely try to find someone that's experienced that'll work with you. Um, obviously, I will work with you. But I talk about how to do these. Um, you can do these virtual, like through a Zoom or a phone call. Exactly. So I do everything via Zoom. Obviously, I will insist that whoever I'm teaching does live in an area where it's legal. It's funny you mentioned Maryland because I have a client who I'm working with now, and I, you know, he was ready to go right away. I was like, hold on, hold on, let's wait till July because I know what the legislation is in Maryland, and we're going to wait until it's legal. You know, you 
can go ahead and pay me, but we're not going to get started, you know, until July, until it is legal for you to grow a couple of plants at home. So, uh, so yeah, through Zoom. Uh, but the best advice is to try to work with someone that's that's seen the trial and error. Because the biggest thing I can tell you is this: ninety nine percent of growing is trial and error. So when you run into these problems, it's very hard. So I'll give you an example. I, I read the Cannabis Grow Bible. That was the first thing I ever read. And they have a problem solving chapter, right? If your leaf looks like this, it's a nitrogen deficiency. If your leaf looks like yeah. this, it's a calcium deficiency. I've seen those. Yeah, okay, maybe. But here's the thing. A plant can give you about 10 different signs of stress, but there are an infinite amount of things you can do to screw up your grow. So those guides are not good. Um, what is better is if someone like me says, okay, your, your leaves look like this, your plants look like this. Talk to me about your process. What medium are you using? What nutrients are you using? When, how long have you been experiencing these deficiencies? What kind of airflow do you have? What climate do you live in? What's your elevation? So there's all these different nuances that people don't consider because it is a plant. And it's so important that you understand all these environmental factors before you start growing. Wow. Well, it seems like a, a huge uh, no brainer to enlist in your service. You, 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 um, what kind of questions do you ask on that first 15 minutes? Yeah, let me just Is, pull it up real quick. Yeah, let me. Let me you mind going into that? Two seconds. Yeah, not at all. Let me just pull up my folder here. So, yeah, so the 15 minute QA, obviously the first one. You know, I'm a marketer. How did you find out about me? Right. Um, right. Where are you located? Is that where you're planning to grow? And that's when I will quickly Google the legislation in their respective area if I don't, you know, know it already. Have you ever grown cannabis before? Where do you source your cannabis from now? That is my opportunity to crap on a lot of dispensaries, <laughs> frankly, and tell them why they need to grow their own. What are you looking to find out of this process? Ideally, how do you normally consume? What method? How much do you consume? Is cannabis going to be for some for you or for you and others? Is discretion a concern for you? Are you in a house or an apartment? Talk to me about your budget. What type of strains do you like? So that's it. And okay. based on those questions, I can pretty much build a custom grow to where they're only going to spend the money that they need and they're going to get the best yield possible the very first harvest. My goal is to have people crush yields the very first harvest. And I mention this all the time. It took me a good seven years to get the kind of yields that I consistently get now. And that's because if you're growing well, you're going to get about it's from seed to cure. You're looking at about six months. So if you want to take your time and do it correctly, you're going to get about two major learning curves in a year because it takes six months to harvest. And that's when you learn everything. And that's when you make your adjustments and your pivots for the next harvest. Um, as far as varieties go, um, you know, the, most of the people that I work with, because I'm in a CBD company, see the intoxicating part of cannabis as a side effect and they want to avoid that. Um, can you grow a high CBD or a CBD THC indoors, or does it have to be high THC? No, no, you absolutely can. And I have done that. So I, I grow three different strains. If you want to put them in those buckets, one is, you know, high THC content, high entourage content, then one-to-ones. So, you know, like 12% CBD, 12% THC, um, which I believe are probably the most therapeutic. And then, I've grown uh, specifically one strain that was recently that was a high CBD, a low THC, which was uh, Indiana bubblegum CBD and very, very relaxing, you know, almost like having a couple beers without putting, you know, putting toxins in your body, without putting ethanol in your body. And yeah, you absolutely can. Yeah, no problem. That's good. It's good to hear that because when I asked the dispensaries before I started my CBD company, I was a medical cannabis patient in Maryland and I went to the dispensaries and they didn't have anything available. They just don't have the varieties available. And they said, well, it doesn't grow well inside. So um, um, com com I mean, com complete BS. Um, <laughs> so what they may be referring to is the fact. So we have the farm bill, right? So anything that's less than 0.3% THC can be considered hemp. And when people think of hemp, um, if they're thinking of it correctly, they're thinking of the long stocks that's used for fiber and those sorts of things. And yes, obviously, when you're growing low THC, even low CBD content in real stock hemp, you're going to want acres to play with. But if you're growing a high concentration of CBD flour, then you don't need that acreage. You know, you need a canopy indoor. So the and again, you know, lab testing is very subjective, but the testing for CBD for the Indiana uh, bubblegum CBD strain that I had was around 20% CBD. 
So you don't need all that space. And as far, I'll be the first person to tell you that with the technology now, specifically around LED, indoor, if you do it correctly, is always better than outdoor. I, I don't care who you talk to. Um, I, and I got nothing against outdoor because it's oftentimes more environmentally friendly, which is great. But cannabis, for anyone that's grown cannabis, pests love it. They are obsessed with it, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, because it doesn't, it's not indigenous to North America. It is indigenous to Asia, to the Hindu Kush mountain regions. So we don't have the natural beneficial insects um, concentrated that will help to combat the pests that love cannabis um, in North America. So you typically, if you're going to grow outdoors, oftentimes you have to use some of those noxious chemicals that oftentimes will create the type of high that for the people who smoke organic cannabis will have a really adverse effect. Now, again, um, people will say things like, well, the sun is the best source. Actually, it's not. So, I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit. So full spectrum is what you want, which is what the sun does, but the sun is very, very hot. So if you are not growing strands that have been engineered for, you know, desert climates, it's going to cause heat stress to your plants and that's going to give you an inferior product. I use, and I can't promote these guys enough, Fluence Bioengineering Full Spectrum LEDs. They actually extract infrared radiation. So where you can have the lights right above the top colas and you will not feel hardly any heat radiation onto those plants. So you can get the dense concentration of trichomes, the dense concentration of terps and all the things that you want from a really dense uh, PPFD level but you're not going to get the stress that is inherent with having high pressure sodium or metal halide lights that are right next to the plant. So the LED technology that's come out now, it gives you the benefits of the sun without some of the negative heat um, things that aren't so beneficial. And do you recommend um, soil or hydroponic or any specific grow medium there? Always soil, 100%. So I will tell you that hydroponic is very efficient. Your plants will grow faster. But again, that's where I'm a I'm against that stuff. I'm against the stuff. I'm against 24 hour photo periods. It's terrible. causes great stress to your plants. I, I am against, and I've done all these things. I, everything that I say, don't do, I've done because you hear this stuff through the grapevine. Like, oh, 24 hours. Well, it'll grow twice as fast. No, they just won't sleep and they get twice as stressed. And so I've done, um, I've done drip emitters. I have done ebb and flow. And the biggest difference that I noticed, one is that you can't really use hardly anything organic in hydroponic systems, because even if you use organic bottled nutrients, they clog the lines. So definitely always, always soil. But the biggest difference when it comes to consumption is the taste. The smell is similar. You crack open a jar, you're going to find similar smell. But the taste itself, when you're actually consuming it, is night and day from soil. And I will say, even though I do a mix of synthetic and organic products, Living till permaculture, I think those are the absolute best for taste when it comes to consuming cannabis. The thing about living soil, the thing about permaculture and regenerative farming, it's great for the environment in ways and other ways, not as much. And what I mean by that specifically is I've done organic farming and with the same strain and by strain, I mean, same cultivar. So a clone of another plant in a, mm -hmm. in a controlled environment where everything is a control besides the medium. And I would get between half and two thirds of the yield using an organic process for soil, as opposed to using a soil medium. But then I do introduce synthetic uh, bottle nutrients in addition to some organic stuff. That's a process I've really dialed in. So then you have to use more electricity. You got to do more harvest. You got to use more labor. So it's harder on the environment from that perspective. So there's all these levels and, and pulleys that you got to consider, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. Once you hit one mole, you know, a mole comes up on the other side. So it's, it's always a, uh, a moving scale. Yeah. Got it. Um, the last question, and then I'll, um, I want you to give us a good contact follow-up for you for the people that want to schedule a time to get a consultation with you. And it's nice that you do it for free. Um, what's the, um, cost, uh, do you have a ballpark cost for the materials and is it something that people can order from Amazon or do they need a local cannabis store? So the first thing I'll say is, you know, the whole point of a consultation is to do a custom for them. So there's no real ballpark of, of how much they, they can spend because a person who consumes an ounce a day is very different from a person who consumes an ounce in a month. But what I will say is that if you don't consume a great deal, you can develop a small grow for what it costs for one ounce 
in Chicagoland. So $400, yes, for that, you can build out a small grow. What I will say is avoid Amazon, avoid the, it's very tempting. Don't get me wrong. I get on Amazon and I see the all-in-one kits, you know, they got everything. <laughs> they got the lights, which is usually some crappy switchboard light. They will provide the, the nutrients, you know, the, the soil, all these different things. But again, they're just throwing together a one size fits all. That's not going to be custom for what you want. And that's the whole point of the survey is what are you looking to get out of this? Are you someone that just wants to get as much butt as possible? Um, I always obviously lean people towards taking whatever steps creates the most efficacious cannabis as medicine, because just like you, Stephen, it is medicine, 100 percent. And I understand people smoke, you know, recreationally. I use it recreationally. But whether you like it or not, it's medicine because we're hardwired to get high. And it's the closest thing that we have as medicine for homeostasis because we are so hardwired through the endocannabinoid system. So I try to lean people towards what's going to be the most cost effective for them, but also not skimping on the things that are going to help to make it the best medicine. That's fair. That's fair. All right, Nick. Well, it's been good talking with you today and I could talk to you all day. I will be following up with you to get a consultation because in Maryland, when starting on Saturday, nice. um, we can start growing. So, um, you know, nice. getting a medical card, I get four, uh, four plants, nice. which is, which is pretty cool. Um, the, uh, best way to follow up with you, Nick, what, what are you want to send people? Yeah. So, um, I'll put in the comments, um, I don't know. Can I can I comment on the comments? I don't think I have access. Or maybe my no, screen. I don't know if that. Uh, well, here I can post something in here. What's uh, what do you want me to type in here? Yeah. So uh, if you just type in cannabis homegrowconsulting.com, super simple. That is my website, and then you can actually go on there, learn about me. I've got an about the founder page. Sign up for the free consultation. You'll cannabis see it. homegrowconsulting.com. Correct. Let's see. And then you'll see all my social media on there. Um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, those will all be at the bottom of the homepage and you can link and follow me directly on there. All right, cool. That was the first time I did a comment from the live stream and it looks like it went to, uh, YouTube, like YouTube, Facebook, and, uh, I'm not sure if it goes to LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a little bit different terms of agreements with StreamYard, but anyway, um, if anyone has any interest, just put a comment, we'll be monitoring them and we can always get you in touch with Nick. Um, thanks so much, Nick. You're helping so many people get clean cannabis and hopefully we get some more people in Maryland to start growing because I want to get a nice community of people that can support each other and um, share tips and tricks as well. So nice. Well, thank you, Stephen. Really appreciate your time. Awesome, man. Thank you.